Okay. Hello, I'm Johanna Ralston, Chief Executive Officer of the World Obesity Federation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to our special World Obesity Day scope uh, webinar on childhood obesity, including um, perspectives on management of childhood obesity. Our theme for World Obesity Day this year is around changing perspectives and changing the narrative. And this is going to be an important step in achieving that. We're very excited about our World Obesity Day Atlas, which will be launched uh, on World Obesity Day itself on March 4th. And that really shows that the challenge of childhood obesity is only worsening around the world, that um, rates are expected to increase by 100% uh, in the next, uh, between now and 2035 for boys and by 125% for girls, therefore um, we're on a trajectory that is absolutely headed in the wrong direction. And the, uh, the shift really is, uh, is taking place to populations in low and middle income countries where there are fewer resources to address childhood obesity. So today you will be hearing from several experts and colleagues about medical education, about management of childhood obesity, and about how World Obesity Day can be an important tool as we work together to coordinate efforts and to accelerate attention to and resources for childhood obesity around the world. Um, we a uh, couple of housekeeping points. Um, <clears throat> there's a Q&A button down and at the bottom of your screen, and please feel free to post questions there. We will be uh, addressing those as we go. And also uh, note that the session is being recorded and will be available to you after today's uh, event. So again, um, happy World Obesity Day. I do think one, one, one thing to keep in mind is that this is actually potentially an incredibly promising and important and transformative time for addressing childhood obesity. At the World Health Assembly in May, 2022, member states approved a series of obesity recommendations and an acceleration plan with a heavy focus on childhood obesity so that all countries would have access to the best possible recommendations, tools, and approaches to addressing obesity in their countries. Of course, these need resources and cooperation. So that is partly where World Obesity Federation is working with all of you to ensure that we can have aligned efforts around this. But again, it's, it's between now and 2030, a series of strategies and targets are being um, realized. And so we really look forward to that work. We also have, as many of you know, next week, Lancet Global Health is uh, hosting the uh, a childhood obesity webinar on a uh, summit, sorry, on Thursday and Friday of next week on March 2nd and 3rd in advance of World Obesity Day. What's also exciting about that is that there's going to be a number of abstracts published in Lancet Global Health from all over the world, looking at the most recent uh, evidence and data on childhood obesity. So it's another very important tool in our, um, in our portfolios. And we are really excited that we also partner closely with UNICEF and other organizations that are committed to addressing childhood obesity around the world. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome the uh, co-chair of the World Obesity Federation Clinical Care Committee and an expert on childhood obesity in her own right from France, Professor Marie-Laure Frelu. Marie-Laure? You're muted, Marie-Laure. Can we unmute you? Okay. Is it fine? Okay. Good. Is it okay for? Okay. It's good. It's fine. Yes, that's fine. Later. Okay. So, hi everybody. I'm extremely pleased today to be given the opportunity to present you this very hot topic, for which I've been working since many years, and which is uh, worsening around the world. So we have really to understand into depth how and why it develops. And what I'm trying to do is to share with you the last knowledge we have about this and the last understanding we have in order to try to manage and protect children. So let's go. Um, so I'm a pediatrician, of course, and uh, I've been spending a lot of time um, starting with the European Childhood Obesity Group and now with the World Obesity Federation, thinking about these topics with my colleagues all around the world. So what we are going to discuss about is the epidemiological evidence and then so some specific topics related to childhood obesity, early biological factors, 
the role of early lifestyle patterns, complications which are silent at the beginning, the psychological burden it is already for young children, and how to win in order to lose so that we get uh, early action and support to offer to the young people. So the epidemiological evidence has grown over years. And when you look at this map, you can be really afraid of looking at what was the situation in the 60s, last century, where, where virtually no child at all was a bees in this world. And if you go around the years, if you pass across different uh, time period of time, you see where we are right now. In the, in the worst situation, where in some parts of the world, children, the proportion of children with obesity is above 40% of the population. And then virtually all the world is concerned with this problem. So we, we estimate now that over four, nearly 400 millions of children have above five years old have facing the problem of obesity, why already nearly 40 million below for five years of age have got this uh, terrible disease which is developing. So a problem you have to keep in mind in uh, regarding childhood obesity is that it may be associated to the classical malnutrition, which meant that uh, um, even if children were not so much deprived of calories, they may be deprived of essential vitamins and nutrients. So that you may have a combination in the same countries of classically undernourished children and children with obesity, but with a poor nutritional status. And this has to be really examined into detail when you face a local situation. So, why should we look at the dynamic of childhood obesity with different highs than we do for adults? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's because children are growing and because the process of obesity is a very dynamic one. So in order to state whether a child is obese or not, or what the level is at the population level, we have to use growth charts, which and help us to understand the dynamic within a given child, to assess the degree according to age and sex, to compare weight and height velocity, and I'll show you some example of that. Growth charts also allow to suggest specific causes in children, and of course, will be supports in order to define therapeutic goals and for public health workers to define which level of success you would like to reach. So let's have a look at a, 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 an example of growth chart. Here on this screen, you see on the left part, a chart for a child with where you see the, the height. So this child is growing on the median uh, curve for height and you see that step by step, his weight has been growing. And this classical model is a model of, for obesity of mild level, but in which we are often failing to identify some specific cause. And on the left, on the right of the screen, you see the BMI for age, and you see how step by step the BMI of this child has not decreased as expected around the age of two, but is still developing so that the child is really uh, worsening uh, and the situation is worsening. What we call the obesity rebound has not taken place in this young child. Let's have a look at, at the next slide. So early risk factors, are something also, is something also very specific to children. The risk for a child to become obese does not start on the day of his birth. It starts during his mother's pregnancy because he is inheriting the um, biological background of the mother and the biological 
background, especially during obesity. So during pregnancy, obesity in the mother, excessive weight gain during pregnancy, even if the mother did not have obesity at the beginning of the pregnancy, gestational diabetes, in other words, the presence of a insulin resistance and intrauterine growth retardation are for sure high risk factors for these babies. After birth and during the first two years of life, which leads to altogether to the first thousand days of life, main risk factors which are identified are a low birth weight with excessive or continuous catch-up growth. So the point is that the highest catch-up in growth in a small for gestational age baby is not necessarily the best for him with regard to the later risk of obesity. A high birth weight, of course, has already, already been known as uh, high risk factors, and the high birth weight has to be um, managed as well as possible with uh, adequate early feeding, ad adequate weaning period, and type of di diversification that would help to regulate the later growth pattern. And what is very important also in young children is the early spontaneous physical activity facilities. Too many babies and toddlers now do not uh, face the right environment to move enough and to develop the early psychomotor skills that will then help them being active children and active adolescents and even adults in later life. So this very early times uh, period of time is extremely important and you should not forget that sleep that takes more than half of the life in young children has to be really protected and of a high quality. Beyond two years of age, of course, there is still, uh, as there can still be risk factors of obesity, but the influence of the family uh, becomes more and more important, and uh, the expression of the personal, personal biological background of the child will be conditioned by the fact that the family either has a lifestyle that protects protects or to the opposite that leads to increased uh, sedentary behavior and uh, unadapted uh, food intakes. So the early lifestyle physical and physical activity is much more important than was previously thought. We know now that toddlers may, all, as I told you before, do not may not have it, uh, time enough to move, and that children younger than six years of age have to be protected against too long exposure to screens, as do also older children. And getting time enough to move if you use screens is absolutely fundamental, either in the prevention or in the treatment of a child with obesity. We know that uh, if a child does not move enough when he is young, then he will have lower motor skills, lower physical fitness. This lower physical fitness will lead to later input fitness, which will, will be a fixed process, and then to a lower uh, decrease in, uh, in physical activity. And when you look at this map around the world, you can only be struck by the number of adolescents who are around the world performing less than 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity daily, which should be the rule for them in order to be healthy and to be fit. And of course, there are many regions in the world where we do not still have data, but we can still 
can see that still in many countries with different lifestyle, the processes is taking place equally. So if you, we look right now at the problem of the abnormal eating pattern uh, that leads to excess energy intake, in children as in adults, it may be not something very simple for which you would have to refer only to uh, an adequate socioeconomic context. Many uh, risk factors or individual uh, patterns may lead to abnormal eating pattern. Here you see anxiety, a low society, which refers to some sort of individual genetic background, abnormal taste sensitivity, which is quite common, and some psychological features that have to be treated, uh, especially by psychologists, like binge eating or food neophobia, because they reflect really individual problems. So all this has to be kept in mind when you want to tackle the problem adequately. Let's have a look. So if we, we look uh, into more detail at what may cause abnormal eating patterns and energy intakes, we have to understand that several factors can disturb nat natural regulation. And the perception related to food do not, is not, are not based only by, to, by hunger, but also by the capability to feel society, to desire some food, or to enjoy eating. So the factors behind appetite regulation are genetic and epigenetic disturbance. And here we turn back to the risk of the link to the mother uh, in heritage and the genetic uh, background of the mother or, and, and father, both parents are concerned, to the educational attitude, which uh, is extremely important regarding especially diet, which may be too much available or op opposingly in family where there are too many restrictions, there may be a counter reaction by the child which we will tend to overeat. In some families with habits of good eaters, the child may be overfed just for that reason. Eating in front of the television of any screen is extremely dangerous because it leaves a child with a poor control of the amount of food he is eating. He does not realize how much or how long he is eating in that situation. Other env environmental factors uh, play a key role, such as food preparation, the sizes of the portions which are served, and all these pocket formats which are, which are so easily available and usually so palatable. And of course, psychoaffective factors, such as states of anxiety or stress, play a role, but there you have to understand what they are for a child, and of course, states of anxiety or stress for a child are not the same than for an adult. So when looking at a child or a general risk level in a population, you have to look at all these risk factors to explore them and to try to manage as, a, as adequately for each child individually. So, I would like here to um, stress about the problem of the, the recent problem of uh, some industrial food, which being either highly palatable because they are salty or sweet or fat, can be eaten in much in a much bigger amount than a normal food or a homemade food, just because the salty taste or the sweet taste will mask the fat content. A problem too are these sugary drinks or acidic drinks that where the acidic nature or the gas will mask the amount of sugar drunk. The problem we have now also with uh, industrial food are that portions 
are si have similar size, whichever the, the age of the child is. They are roundly accessible, and of course, there are very often high pressure to eat from adverse and pears. So we have really, really to pay attention to the quality of food which is served to these children. We know right now that um, if uh, juice is cons consumed at one year of age, then there is a, an increased risk of uh, drinking much more sweet beverages at seven years old of age, and the obesity prevalence is likely to be multiplied by two at six years of age. So the only drink a young child to consume, in addition to the milk he requires, is water. Then, if later in life, the fact to drink on a daily basis soft drinks is associated to a higher risk of, of overweight or obesity as early as young age of school children. Let's stay, go to the next slide. So the, the recent uh, problem of ultra processed food is now better understood. Uh, an ultra processed food is not only an industrial food, is a food which has been so much tra transformed that it is, it is less tasty. It, there is less difference in, among the tastes of a va variety which are presented. It is high in free sugar, saturated fat and sodium. It's very poor in low in protein and important nutrients, it's very easy to chew, so that the consumption worldwide is dramatically increasing and is already the majority of food consumed by children in many countries instead of homemade foods or of fresh uh, vegetables or fruits. With this kind of foods, there is a high risk of nutritional deficiency combined to obesity. And of course, this kind of food, when it is consumed in early infancy, leads to an, uh, some sort of later addiction if the child is not educated to consume more classical food, local food, as the previous generation would do. So, Childhood obesity has also another peculiarity that it has its own complication. And those complications that will be evident in adulthood start early, but start being silent. The complications we, we see in children are rather varied and uh, can start quite early. If you look for instance at this uh, figure, you will see that um, while a quarter of young children at one or two years of age, or, or but more than three quarters of, of those of 10 years old will become a bis adult, they will start very early with complications that will become more and more severe with a degree and duration of obesity. This uh, early onset obesity, and I'll show you why, increases mortality rate into, in adulthood. So the purpose of the evaluation of children with obesity is to assess the obesity-related comorbidities, related, of course, from excess fat mass, excess fat mass whether these complications are still silent or not. What, which are these complications? You see a lot of uh, uh, patches here, a lot of frames. So you can find here complications you have already heard about uh, for adults. Metabolic and cardiovascular complication, liver, complication with a 
uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that may start very early, respiratory disease, musculoskeletal disease, which in children means mainly pain and difficulty in difficulty to move, endocrine complications, which are mostly silent, but anyway starting. And while in many children you are not yet at the stage of type 2 diabetes, in, uh, in most children, insulin resistance is very, very common. And in addition to that, you can also see the psychosocial complications, which will lead the child to have many difficulty to face the, the, the weight gain if he is not really supported by competent and, uh, uh, and adults which will be uh, looking at him carefully and on a long-term basis. The psychosocial social complication include very early social stigmatization, including by other children at school as, year, as early as four to five years of, of age, and then poor self-esteem, anxiety, and uh, at the end of the day, it, it may also lead to depression and eating disorders. On this slide, you see the illustration of the way that cardiovascular mortality is increased during adolescence according to the, the degree of overweight in, uh, in the younger age. So here on the right, you see the BMI percentile at adolescence and the cumulative risk of mortality according to the BMI percentile in young age. And you see that there is a huge difference with, between the risk if you are in the higher centiles with the risk if you are quite a lean person across childhood and adolescence. Let's go. So I'll stress a little bit more on the complication linked to uh, abnormal glucose metabolism and the risk of uh, insulin resistance. Before diabetes, the insulin resistance is the key element that will enhance or give birth to the metabolic syndrome. And this metabolic syndrome, which uh, is uh, the name for an association of a high blood pressure, risk of diabetes, fatty liver, is something which really is a very severe condition then into adults and a great, great complication in, in adults. This uh, glucose metabolism and insulin resistance level is very much uh, backed or enhanced according to the, in the family history of uh, type 2 diabetes in the second or uh, first degree relative is varies also a lot according to ethnicity with a special risk level in the people from uh, um, South Africa, um, which is which, um, from African origin and those from Asian origin. It is increased by the fact of being born with a small for gestational age uh, weight. And of course it's increased by smoking during gestation. Here you see examples of uh, one clinical feature which is called acanthosis nigricans, and where the skin is a little bit darker and rougher, and which is can, can be seen whichever is the, the, the color of the skin. And here you see a, a picture illustrating a fatty liver in a child and the high risk for some children to get to the, up to the process of fibrosis and of a, a short, shortened life because of cirrhosis. Orthopedic complications are peculiar to children because the, um, the legs, are, the, the, the bones, bone do not have 
uh, yet fully grown, there may be a necrosis of these uh, weak parts uh, with uh, some very painful and dangerous condition uh, on the hip, which are called a vascular necrosis or sleep capital femora epiphysis, which means that the type of physical activity that these children will perform will be reduced and then re-education will be required. Legs as axis, because of the weight bird by the child, uh, can be modified and painful. And here, I just would like to show you that uh, uh, you have to be a good clinician to make a difference between a real orthopedic complication, which is called a genuvalgum, where you see that the leg axis is not anymore the right, and a common situation where it is just the volume of the tides which uh, makes the fact that the ankles are a little bit more apart from one another, but without real complication. Psychological complication uh, have been during a lot of time quite almost ignored in children. And step by step, we, we were led to understand that they were absolutely essential to diagnose and to prevent. Sometimes these consequences are very early and severe. They require a precise evaluation and especially they require to detect how far and how early a decreased quality of life is felt by the, by the child. Because if this is not detected, then you won't be able to interrupt the vicious cycle of decreased quality of life, depression, and overeating, even in young children. So the role of the clinician is to try to disentangle the causes and consequences of obesity prior to setting therapeutic goals and to, of course, ask for support of psychologists if he thinks it is required. We also have as clinicians to know that a poor sleep quality, whether the sleep duration is too short or whether the quality of sleep is not good because the, the child has starts having a, apnea is bad, then if this, um, sorry, if this quality of sleep is not good, we are enhancing the risk of obesity and we are uh, paying, we, we have to, um, if we want to be successful in treatment, we have to cure or to treat or to prevent the re reasons why the, the child is not sleeping well in order to be efficient. So, so the, you here have summarized the vicious cycle of uh, complication in, of childhood obesity from the psychological point of view. And you see that starting with overweight of obesity, which can be enhanced, of course, by the genetic and epigenetic background, you can reach the stage with where the child is suffering from bullying, especially from schoolmates, but it may also be the same in the family, either by parents or by the brother and sister who may not be uh, suffering overweight themselves. This will lead the child to avoid the situations and activities in which uh, uh, he, he will fat, feel uncomfortable. And of course, his quality of life will decrease. This child which, who avoids uh, this situation, we feel, of course, bored. He will feel less self-confident. And this may have consequences on his, the results at school and lead him to uh, use more often screen in order to try to dream to a better life. And then, of course, he may, of, he may face uh, lower appetite regulation because of being using much more screens and being facing, of course, adverts, will snack and overeat, and of course, will be facing a situation of a higher risk of 
weight gain. And of course, if the only solution is you offer is to put him on diet or to restrict the food intake, then you are really not tackling the real problem from the point of view of the child, which is a whole dynamic process and not a simple situation of being overeating at a given moment. Of course, the social background is essential, but it's only a part of the system in which a child can be blocked if he, we do not understand what is really happening to him. <clears throat> so in order to lose weight, and in fact, we do not ask children to lose weight, but to stop gaining excess weight, you have to know how to win. And so this is, this, this is of course, a real strategy, which starts with making the right diagnosis from the clinical examination of a child. And here you have some example of the way you may get to the conclusions that you are facing only a primary obesity and not some sort of disease, which are rare. It's less than 10% of the severe obesity in children. And if in the case you are sure, you are almost sure you are facing a primary obesity, then the whole strategy I've been speaking about applies fully. If not, you have, of course, to ask for specialists to try to adapt to these very special conditions. Next slide. So altogether, I would like to, to end my presentation with some key points, which are uh, for, and with main the main messages that for an individual, you have to settle an individual strategy. And this strategy is based on the following points. Take time to analyze the situation. Refer to other specialists or reference centers as appropriate. It may be very difficult in some case to manage childhood obesity. Give feedback to the child and, or the adolescent and the parents. It's a, a difficult process as you understand it. Everyone may have a role, a precise role in the, within a, a family. So all this has to be fully understood by the child and the adolescent. And also point is to introduce changes very progressively, ensuring that they are realistic, they are, that they have no negative effects on social links. And we saw how much a child can be can feel lonely, are based on changes in recipes and daily lifestyle, not a revolution, but mild changes which, may, which will apply to the real context in which a child is living. You have to respect the family culture as much as possible. And of course, in most of many countries in the world, you have to take seasonality into account. It may not be the, take, the case in uh, tropical areas, but in countries such as uh, uh, those from uh, the northern part of the world, of course, you won't ask the same changes during summertime and during winter time. And a very important point in children is not to assign a weight, a precise weight objective, but rather different uh, present lifestyle goals that in turn will lead to limiting weight gain and because growth is still going on to lead to a lower BMI because the child will be growing without gaining weight or with losing a little bit of weight. And of course, nothing can happen if you can't offer a regular follow-up, which is extremely important in such a painful process, which is a constitution of childhood obesity. So this was uh, the main points I wanted to, to, uh, to offer you, to present you. There are the results of my own experience and of my colleagues' thoughts and experience, and I hope they will help you 
and I'm here now to try to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Um, may I just pose one question that was in the uh, Q&A section? Um, uh, for the, thank you so much for that excellent uh, presentation. It says my voice is not audible. Can you hear me, Marie Lau? Very well. Okay, good. All right. Um, babies aged 16 months with a body weight of 27 kilograms from the, were from the start not given exclusive breastfeeding due to the health conditions of their mothers who had biliary disease. So they were not able to provide exclusive breastfeeding. How can health workers provide care for babies, especially to improve their nutritional status and avoid this sort of higher, higher weight among children who were not given exclusive breastfeeding from the start? Well, the point is that at that case is that uh, you you can use um, the process of weaning uh, with a uh, with a select a selection of food that will respect the society, feeling of society for the child. Uh, clearly, using a lot of vegetables and giving water to drink in order in other in addition to, to milk or, or dairies, and avoiding, of course, feeding the child with um, carbohydrates. So there may be some, but not too much. And let the child move, which is excellent. And also have given times for meals, four meals per day, and not a continuous presentation of food during the day, which, of course, which would... Uh, uh, not allow the child to discover the feeling of society. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Just, thank you. And of course, look at the size of the portions, which have to be adapted to age, and not only to the, the appetite. Good. So one one more question, and then I'll I'll need to um to shift to the next speaker. But uh, what is the target weight loss for children, like an adult? So sort of adults at seven to ten percent, uh, for example. What, what would you say is target weight loss for children, or is it non-weight regain, as you said at the end of your most no, it's, uh, previous in slide? In, in children, what, uh, when the child is an old adolescent, of course, we, we, we tend to, to, to shift to adults' uh, goals. But um, in children, the, the point is to help them grow without gaining more weight Correct. And, okay. and feeling more comfortable with their body. We have a few more questions, but what I'd like to uh, defer them till a little bit later so that we can um, uh, we can go on to the next section and then we'll have some time just before the end. I'm uh, delighted to introduce Shubo Seifel, who is our uh, uh, manager of education for World City Federation. Thank you, Marie Lau, and please stay on and, uh, and, and uh, so we can um, have you answer questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Johanna. Um, can, you, can you see my screen? Thank you. So, um, Today, my presentation will be talking and uh, discussing about the importance of medical education to empower healthcare professional. Just a second. Um, so, um, second. Um, so, in my role as education and projects manager, I support the administration, planning, and uh, enhancement and delivery of the organizational education program scope and the e learning platform as well. Um, so today, I'll just give you a brief overview of why, why medical ed education is important on childhood obesity and why we need to address this. As Marido has explained in a presentation, um, uh, as of 2022, we uh, trade 340 million people of the world's population aged 5 to 19 years old are affected by overweight obesity. Uh, the World Obesity Federation has projected that this specific bracket by two 2025 uh, will be um, uh, will reach eleven percent, and this has um, this has different health impacts such as uh, uh, that can contribute to conditions such as type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory problems, joint problems, mental and social well-being as well to be affected, and it is proven that obesity can significantly affect a child's quality of life and lead to serious health problems later in life. So in this slide, I just show some of the research that we have up there. Um, one research said how healthcare providers often lack knowledge, skills, and resources to effectively manage childhood obesity. Uh, another research just mentions how education during medical schools and um, residency are the most prevalent barriers to obesity care. And another study just highlights and enhances the, the first study that we mentioned, how um, pediatric residents' knowledge and attitudes towards childhood obesity 
uh, they often lacked confidence and skill to manage uh, childhood obesity. So um, as we've just mentioned, these studies have shown that healthcare professionals may not feel comfortable or confident in discussing weight-related issue with the patients. It may not have the necessary knowledge or skills to address childhood obesity effectively. So the studies, uh, among others, suggest that education is a critical component in preventing, managing, and treating childhood obesity, both for healthcare providers and families. This missed opportunity for prevention and treatment may contribute to the growing prevalence of childhood obesity. So therefore, um, to address these issues, uh, there have been calls for increased education and training in childhood obesity management for healthcare professionals. And um, this includes uh, providing continuing education opportunities for practicing healthcare professionals improving access to evidence-based resources and guidelines. Therefore, World Obesity Federation developed SCOPE, which provides healthcare professionals with up-to-date, evidence-based knowledge and resources on obesity prevention and treatment, enabling them to continue the professional development and, pro and provide the patient with the best possible care. Such efforts could help to better equip healthcare professionals to address childhood obesity and improve outcomes for children and families affected by this condition. Um, so in this slide, um, I just mentioned, um, I just give um, an overview of how scope add values to obesity practice. And the first point is mainly to uh, just by completing or doing scope, uh, you will gain an in-depth knowledge of obesity epidemiology because SCOPE certification provides a comprehensive overview of the science behind obesity and it gives you an in-depth understanding of why obesity is a chronic relapsing progressive disease, the causes of obesity and the impact of genetics, how obesity is impacted by factors including age, sex and ethnicity and specific consideration for children, how environmental, socioeconomic, and um, behavioral factors contribute to obesity and the obesity incidence, prevalence, and trends globally. Medic medical education can, can help healthcare professionals to make informed decisions and provide evidence based care to their patients. So, in the, the next slide, I just, in this slide, I just mentioned how uh, developing just by uh, doing uh, medical education in obesity management can, can help you to, to, um, to develop some skills in obesity management. And uh, these, these are some skills that we mentioned, but they're not limited to um, for children and adolescents uh, that just by completing scope, you'll be able to take a comprehensive obesity fo focused medical history um, you'll be able to um, uh, use a nutritional and behavioral intervention to develop a personalized obesity management care plan. And you'll be able to apply clinical, uh, clinical reasoning skills when uh, interpreting tests. And, and as well as that, you'll be, um, you'll be able to have this, inter, uh, this interdisciplinary collaboration where, um, where among healthcare professionals such as pediatrician, dietitian, and physical therapy therapist. And this can lead to a more comprehensive approach to managing uh, childhood obesity. So SCOPE will also help you to expand knowledge around obesity-related comorbidities. Uh, just to mention that we have over 60 modules on our SCOPE learning platform. Majority of them are free of charges. And we go beyond and in depth in this condition, such as diabetes and prediabetes, um, obesity and COVID-19. We have different learning paths as well. And the, the next presentation, Marido will be presenting on childhood obesity path, where we have six modules on the Scopy Learning Platform. But uh, these are just, uh, just a summary of some of the um, topics that we go through. And uh, 
one other um one other point that can that the scope can can help you to with the to add value in obesity practice is to enhance communication skills and will help you to improve relationship with patient um so we um effective communication with patients is essential for successful obesity management and scope will help you to equip healthcare profession with the skills to um raise the issue of weight it will help you to raise the issue of weight and uh, it will avoid weight bias and understand its detrimental impact on patient outcomes and will help you to distinguish between approaches that are both acceptable and supportive to patients sorry um so in summary medical education in obesity management can add a value to obesity practice for childhood obesity by improving knowledge, confidence, skills, uh, collaboration, improve the collaboration, and as well as that as the patient outcome as well. So now we um, just explain what scope certification is. Um, scope is the scope certification is the gold standard competency in treatment and management of obesity. Um, the credits, the credits also uh, also known as scope points, can be earned through online courses, or you can attend live training opportunities such as scope school. And uh, in order to be scope certified, uh, healthcare professionals they need to provide six months of practic uh, practical clinical experience related to obesity management. And this certification has to be renewed annually to ensure up to date knowledge. So in this slide, uh, we've just summarized some feedback that we've received from um, our co-learning path. Uh, the co-learning path is, uh, is uh, needed to, in order to, to get the scope certification. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a course that uh, has eight modules covered that covers um, essentials of obesity management, including the causes of obesity, complication, how to raise the issues of obesity with patients, how to take the history and conduct an examination, and how to achieve weight loss, um, as well as how to address obesity in children and adolescents. Um, and it's a course that is, um, that is uh, authored by uh, uh, Louise, uh, our director of, uh, our, sorry, our president of, uh, of WOLF. So, think yes um i just wanted to say that i wish you the best of luck in your obesity education and if you have any questions or need any assistance related to obesity education or any other topics please don't hesitate to contact us i will now leave the platform to marie law uh, who will be presenting the childhood obesity path uh, that is available on scope thank you So I'm just right now back to you, and uh, I would like to present you briefly the six modules that we have been, thanks to the WOLF, being able to develop about childhood obesity. As you saw from, you heard from my previous talk, childhood obesity is a quite a complex question, and it was absolutely necessary to help you and to help everybody uh, tackle every particular problem in the in the right way. So, some of the answers that people are raising right now are in these modules. So, these six modules. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Uh, um, have as a, as a goal to uh, provide people with a, a comprehensive overview on the, of how to effectively treat and manage obesity and overweight in children and adolescents. So therefore, we discuss quite a broad range of topics, including the identification of early risk factors, the impact of diet, fitness, psychological issues, also the comorbidities, and of course, the way to, to manage and to be aware of the double burden of malnutrition. In each of these modules, we provide 
uh, treatment plans for each category of problem. And of course, for a given child, you have to make a synthesis of all proposals. Let's come to the next slide, of course. So the, the six modules, which you see listed here, are risk factors. And here, there is a detailed um, set of slides showing how to interpret growth charts, the nutritional management of obesity, physical fitness, a slide is, um, a module is dedicated uh, to psychological assessment, and of course, complication and double burden. Let's go to the next slide. So the early risk factors um, of which I've been speaking previously here are presented in a detailed way so that you can uh, both detect them in a child and also uh, have discussion with mother if you see them for the next pregnancy in order to prevent for the next child, next birth, risk factors which may be already present in, a, in, a, in a, the first child of, of, a, of a family. So you will learn from this module which growth charts are available. And you have to know that there are world charts available from uh, the uh, World Health Organization that you can download and that are valid worldwide if your country does not have uh, specular, ch specular charts. And you will learn also from this module how to uh, choose appropriate um, parameters if you want to work in the field of public health. Next slide. The double burden of malnutrition here has been uh, detailed by, in, together with different, uh, oh, you went too quickly, I was, yes. So double burden of malnutrition has been treated here with a, a colleague who specialized in that field. And uh, one part shows the epidemiological part of the, the problem. And another part shows which are the typical um, deficiency you have to think of in obese children living in deprived areas or in deprived conditions. It describes the measure used, it describes the causes and geographical distribution, and it decries the pitfalls uh, and difficulties you have to know if you want to properly interpret nutritional status in presence of obesity. Complications are also um, very much detailed, and we have tried here to help you understand how uh, a number of problems will raise from infancy. We give also definitions that have to be known for children. For example, you can't define hypertension in children using figure for adults describe many keys of the way to diagnose to diagnose complications and uh, it lists some of uh, poorly known pulmonary complications in children with obesity and these pulmonary complications are uh, very uh, high obstacles to adequate physical activity so we stress in this part on all these aspects that may prevent children from moving, moving and from turning to a, a normal life pattern. Next slide. A, a module is dedicated to physical act, fit, fitness in children and adolescents because this is a field of knowledge which is not common uh, to physicians, which is uh, a field of knowledge for developed by people who are, were not used to, uh, uh, to take care of obese children and who have accepted to shift from uh, a very specialized field of knowledge dedicated to uh, sport to the better understanding of the specific problem of childhood and of the consequences of a heavy body. So here, the learning objectives 
are really to properly differentiate the concepts of physical activity, inactivity, and sedentary behaviors, which are not the same, to understand the recommendations which are relevant in young age in presence of obesity, to understand the method used to assess physical activity and fitness, and also to understand the main effects of physical activity on fitness with, in, in children with obesity. In a few words, I, if I may say, children with obesity are not normal, between brackets, children plus X kilos. They are children with specific problems which have to be specifically solved. Next slide. So nutritional management of obesity goes into very much detail about distinguishing between the various causes that lead to overeating, about the identif identification of these causes in order to be able to explain them to a given child and his family, in order to set realistic goals and long-term objectives, and in also to know when it is not anymore adequate to tackle the problem, the feeding problem as a nutritional problem, but when it has to be considered as a psychological or psychiatric problem that will deserve uh, special rules and special management different from the classical uh, nutritional management of child with obesity. The psychological assessment of child and adolescent um, as quite a specific objective. It uh, teaches to anyone how to distinguish between the various psychological pathways leading to, over to overeating, and that you can, I insist that you can follow this module whether you are a psychologist or not. It helps identifying the problems, and uh, it helps also to stipulate uh, which treatment plan would be adequate, if it is the case, and when, of course, to refer to uh, psychologists with a, a special competence in that field beyond the competence of a physician of, or, a, uh, if I may say, an ordinary healthcare provider. Next slide. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank again, Wolf, to, for the creation of these uh, e-modules and all my colleagues from uh, ECOG and around the world that contributed to the construction of these modules. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Lau. That was excellent. And I think now we are going to um, learn more about World Obesity Day itself um, and how we take the, um, the theme of changing perspectives um, around childhood obesity and medical education. And in order to do this, it's my great pleasure to welcome our World Obesity Day manager, Alex Demar. And then I would ask everybody to please continue to pose questions in the Q&A because we will then have about 10 minutes to, uh, to respond to, to several of them and to have a discussion. So is Alex available? I am, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, good to see you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining and also to Marie-Laure and Shubo for an incredible, incredible insight that you both shared with us as well. So this part, as Johanna mentioned of the webinar will be a presentation of this year's World Obesity Day campaign. Uh, including the resources available to you uh, for, for you to use for your events and campaigns and the importance of taking part and sharing stories. As Johanna mentioned, my name is Alex Damari. I'm the Communications and Campaigns Manager, Project Managing World Obesity Day 2023 with World Obesity Federation as the conveners of the cause. The theme for World Obesity Day this year is Changing Perspectives, Let's Talk About Obesity. We're just over a week away from World Obesity Day itself, which is taking place on a Saturday this year, on the 4th of March. So I'd like to share more about the campaign, some data findings along the way, and how you can get involved. 
Following last year's Everybody Needs to Act campaign, this year's campaign highlights the power of talking, because when we talk, debate and share, we can shift norms and transform health outcomes. Obesity is on the rise globally, with new data predicting that one in four people will be living with the disease by 2035. Despite the scale of this epidemic, efforts to address it are challenging due to misconceptions about obesity. Disparities in its perceptions have led to isolation, misunderstanding and inconsistency in how obesity is understood and acted upon by individuals and institutions. The idea behind this year's campaign theme is to highlight the importance of having real conversations to help correct misconceptions around obesity and end stigmas in an attempt to shift from individual views to collective strategies, from me to we. These are not easy conversations to have, but by pushing boundaries, we can make meaningful change and turn words into action, whether influencing uh, and mobilizing policy, policy initiatives, or upending misconceptions in our everyday lives. Previous World Obesity Days have encouraged people to recognize the root causes of obesity, increase knowledge of the disease, tackle weight stigma, foreground the voices of people with lived experience and act to improve the world's understanding, prevention and treatment of obesity. With this year's campaign, we want to harness the power of conversation and stories so that together we can correct misconceptions surrounding obesity and take effective collective action, changing perspectives. We have created a range of assets, all available on the resources page of the World Obesity Day website, from social media posts and printable poster designs to Zoom backgrounds and an array of icons and logos. We have a brand book and campaign toolkit with all the tools that you need for your campaign, as well as providing you with important obesity infographics and fact sheets. These are all currently available on the resources section of the World Obesity Day website, all ready to go with top level campaign messaging and publicly available to print, download and share. In addition to the WAD specific resources, we also have a range of additional resources available to you all year round. The Global Obesity Observatory is a fantastic resource for you to find extensive data on general prevalence, policy development, examples of interventions at local and national level and more for around 200 countries. On the homepage of the observatory website, there's a handy instruction tutorial video to guide you through how to navigate it. We've been collating data for over 20 years and you can browse the interactive map, presentation graphics, data tables, publications, and more using the observatory. This year, our main call to action is a deck of conversation cards to use as prompts when having important discussions around obesity. And here are a few examples. So how do the cards work? You pick any one of the 28 digital or printable conversation cards that we've created available on the website and use the let's talk about prompt to start a conversation. This can be family, teachers, employers, peers at work or key decision makers. On the reverse of the card is a short informative statement to get you started and educate others on obesity. Each card has a guiding question or statement to get everyone talking about obesity together. There is also a blank card for you to fill in with whatever you want to talk about, whether it's obesity in the environment, obesity in your culture, misconceptions around obesity and willpower, or anything you like, you can decide. We're also encouraging everyone to share on social media the card you talked about, and even vote videos of yourselves having these conversations with others using the hashtag, let's talk about obesity and changing perspectives. More information on these cards and relevant information around these topics can be found at the World Obesity Day website. So the first, as an example, says, let's talk about childhood obesity. And on the back is the prompts. We have childhood obesity can profoundly affect children's physical, social and emotional well-being, academic performance and self-esteem. It is often carried through to adulthood. So education, prevention and treatment are vital to stopping a global rise in obesity.
There is a whole range of ways to get involved and help change perspectives on World Obesity, Obesity Day this year and beyond. At the moment, 42% of patients are uncomfortable discussing weight with their doctor. Patients living with obesity routinely face stigma and struggle to access support. This is why effective people-centered treatment and prevention is so important. We have a wide range of resources on the healthcare professionals page of the World Obesity Day website, where, which, you, which can help you to speak openly with patients whilst being sensitive to their potential discomfort and making sure the space for people to discuss their personal experiences and goals is being provided. From information on using people first language to a recommended list of do's and don'ts of how to start a conversation about weight. How can you get involved? You can share your story with us. Anyone can submit a story. It can be a personal story of something that you have done to address obesity, or a story of a project that you've worked on with an organizational group. If you've done something that you want to share, we want to hear about it. The more healthcare professionals understand obesity, the better. So why not organize an event with your peers? Training sessions, lunchtime meetings, or online webinars are a few options to help colleagues understand obesity. Anyone organizing an activity related to the management of obesity will also be able to apply for scope accreditation. Once reviewed by the panel, if your event is granted accreditation, it will then be promoted by World Obesity and on the Scope e-learning portal, and participants will be awarded points which count towards Scope certification. Just don't forget to share your plans with the World Obesity Day team so we can feature them on the World Obesity Day map to let others know what's happening in their region and how they can take part. The newest way is to, to get involved is by using the It's on the Cards conversation card prompts to acknowledge and get talking about the roots of obesity and the factors that contribute to the disease, inspiring others to educate themselves and encourage them to take effective action for better health for all. And last but certainly not least, you can continue your education on the topic. Obesity still remains poorly understood amongst healthcare, healthcare workers as a whole. So you can equip yourself and your team with the skills to support patients living with obesity with World Obesity Federation's Scope Learning. The platform includes over 50 fully accredited e-learning modules in several languages, and you can begin with the core learning path that Shuba mentioned earlier, uh, and then expand your knowledge into a range of specialist areas. By attending this webinar, you have already gained one credit. And for World Obesity Day, we're offering a one-off 30% discount on the Scope Core Learning Path, which is valid until the 1st of April when you use the code WOD2023 on your screens there upon signing up. You can find more ways to join the campaign and get involved on the World Obesity Day website. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you now have a clear idea of the tools and resources available to you in the lead up to World Obesity Day and how you can personally make an impact and get involved. We'll be moving on to a short Q&A session where you'll be able to ask questions regarding any of the topics you've heard about today. Uh, I've also shared on screen here the World Obesity Day email address. So if any questions regarding World Obesity Day aren't able to be answered uh, within this webinar, then please do get in contact and I'll be glad to help. Thank you so much, Alex. That was fantastic. And um, I would like um, if Marilla could also turn on her uh, screen camera. Um, we will have time for some questions and Shubo as well. Um, actually, one practical one is how one person asked at the very end, how can I share the event that I am arranging for World Obesity Day? Uh, do you want to just kind of uh, explain that again or explain that? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, there are, there are many ways to do it. Um, on the World Obesity Day website itself, you'll see towards the right of the menu bar, you'll see um, a little tab called WOD Map, and you can click on there. And if you scroll down, there is a little button that you can press that says share your event. It will bring up a form. You put in your details, make sure to remember a photo, uh, and that will come straight through to us. Alternatively, feel free to use that World Obesity Day, which is WOD at worldobesity.org email address send us any details and we can we can pop that onto the website for you thank you and again
photos, photos, photos. A, a picture tells a thousand words. We love the photos. They're so inspiring. There's such a, you know, mechanism for bonding with one another. And please use the cards. We, uh, we're really excited about them. And we want to, um, we want to generate really interesting, provocative conversations. Because that is, uh, in, in a somewhat polarized world, that is how we're going to get beyond where we've been on this. And, uh, and realize so much of the problem is not uh, medicine or food, but it's talking and changing perceptions and hearts and minds. Marie Lau, there was there was a few questions for you. Could you first tell us a little bit more specifically about the relationship between maternal breastfeeding and childhood obesity? Well, um, maternal breastfeeding is uh, quite protective against uh, obesity until the age of two years of age. Of, uh, of two, two years of life, and uh, it's not an absolute protection, and uh, it decreases the risk of obesity by about uh, 20% altogether, say it. Some breastfed baby, babies tend to be fatter in the very first month, but then they, they will turn back to lean toddlers, so there is no problem if they're a little bit fat while exclusively breastfed. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit also the normal uh, BMI range for, for pediatrics in, in the pediatric? Um, so there phase? are no normal BMI ranges for children. You have to refer to the, to the BMI curves and uh, see which pathways your child is uh, following. And the point is that to, he has to be within the limits and to follow a regular pathway. Once he has chosen his own centile, he has to, uh, to stick to that centile and not to, uh, to, to shift to higher centiles of BMI. Okay. Um, and what about in settings where that's not necessarily established as the norm? I'm sorry, I know that's an impossible question to answer, but um, in some place, you know, in many countries, that's not necessarily, there's not even necessarily um, an understanding of the need to, to address some uh, sort of potential child weight and, and, and BMI is often, you know, it's not measured. Do you have anything sort of in places where there's just far fewer resources and focus on this of what might be some way, what may be some measures that, that, that physicians could do, take? Well, the, you, you have to weight the child and mm -hmm. you have to, to, to make sure that he's uh, uh, slimming a little bit while growing. The child right. can't keep the same body shape between right. two years and five years of age. Great. Thank you very much. Um, because there's been quite a lot of um, debate in the media about the sort of, you know, the, the I mean, thankfully, obesity is really being understood as, as an issue that benefits uh, from being addressed in the healthcare system, which has not always been the case um, and has, in fact, contributed to the problem. But, um, but that's an excellent um, sort of simple, broad measure that, that, that's quite doable. Um, one question was around, what is your opinion uh, about GLP-1 inhibitor use in children. So, um, and again, around that, that there's been a number of European countries this year that have approved it for 12 years and up, and some are on, uh, on track to actually start at age six. It would be interested to hear your response to that. Well, we, we are happy that for uh, the cases of severe obesity of or obesity with proven genetic uh, disorder to have some tools other than bariatric surgery to offer uh, at adolescence or beyond adolescence. There is no indication for GLP-1 agonist in other cases so far in childhood obesity. Great. Um, so Shubha, Shub, I have a question for you around primary care. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but if you're, if you're there, um, do, you, do you see um, scope being um, useful to the physicians in primary care, especially in places where uh, there's much less recognition of an understanding of obesity, so it might not, you might not necessarily even have a huge population of sort of endocrinologists who could, who might know something about it. Thank you for the question. So we have uh, on scope, we have uh, courses that are targeting primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've uh, uh, previously last year as well, we had a scope school, which is uh, something that I haven't addressed during my presentation. And it's the mm -hmm. live component parts of scope learning. Uh, we've, we had a scope school specifically on primary care physicians. So I think there's a lot of content and uh, resources that we provide and they're available on the platform. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's available when the free of charge is to use. And there, is it available in more than English? I've just Can you remind me? Yes, it is available in English, uh, Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and uh, French. 
Excellent. That's great. That's great. Wonderful. Um, we are, we're so excited to be having um, materials offered in multiple languages. And we're, we're right now in the process of getting lots of materials operated, uh, um, translated into, for World Obesity Day, translated into even Arabic and Chinese so that we can really, really have a truly global movement. Um, so, Marina, back to you. Um, can you tell me a little bit in the UK clinical setting, whether it would be the child with obesity, would it be the GP or the endocrinologist who would who would deal with the child, who would address the child? I think that the GP, <laughs> G, GP is the first person uh, mm -hmm. that knows the children, the family, and yep. all the background. So he's surely the person to, uh, to, to has to deal with the problem first. And he has to refer to the endocrinologist if he thinks there is a, this is a peculiar form of obesity. Great, thank you. There was... Um, there was how much time would you allow for for a sort of a, a GP or sort of how will time allow for a GP to deal with weight issues, given how busy the demands on their time and, and how might you advise around that? Trying to be well, pragmatic with the, the kind of time that they have. I think when a problem is complex, you should not try to um, to tackle everything during the same consultation. You have to go step by step and see the patient again, fixing the next object, the objective of the next next consultation, uh, with parents bringing more information uh, by the according to the consultation, so that you can really build up some sort of uh, uh, individual understanding and perspective. Great. Thanks. There was another specific question um, about how long can GLP-1 inhibitors be used? Uh, sorry? How long can we use GLP-1? GLP-1, so, so some of the new medicines, the new pharmacotherapy. Well, so far, nobody knows. <laughs> we know. Uh, yeah. but there, there is a shift, we know, uh, you know, in the, in the way we are considering obesity. Um, obesity is not anymore considered as disease for which after a, few, a while, the patient has to stop the treatment and be on his own and uh, fail or, or, or win. It, has, it is now considered as a chronic disease. And <laughs> for chronic disease, you may uh, provide a drug on a, on a long-term basis as long as the patient requires it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, here's an interesting question from the Philippines, where there is definitely significant race, rates of childhood obesity as well as adult obesity. Uh, does one need to be a pediatrician to manage pediatric obesity patients, pediatric patients with obesity? Uh, this individual is an internship practicing obesity medicine in the Philippines and hesitant to uh, handle obesity among uh, pediatric patients as opposed to just adult patients. It's not a matter of being a pediatrician. It's a matter of understanding children. So uh -huh. This is not a privilege of pediatrician. This is a privilege of anybody who really uh, makes the effort to know about the way a child develops and things and what is interesting from the perspective of the child. Thank you. Yes, and, and we, we, we're very proud, and, and thanks to, to, to your leadership and expertise, that... Um, Again, the core learning path on, on childhood obesity that, that SCOPE offers is an important uh, set of foundational principles that, that, that can really be supportive. And then we, we, uh, we like to, you know, we're aware that there's networks of mutually supportive um, uh, physicians uh, communicating with each other around the world because obesity is, is, is so new to many health systems. And again, it's only this, since uh, less than a year that WHO really, that ICD-11 went into effect that really acknowledged obesity as a as a complex multifactorial disease. So Sorry, you have we've lost you. Oh no. I you lost me. I think you're back now, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I just got it. Your your connection is unstable. I'm in Boston where there's been a big snowstorm, so apologies. <laughs> That's probably why. Um, what is the treatment for bottle Bardet beetle syndrome? Well, the Bardet beetle syndrome is a genetic syndrome which gives a new view about childhood obesity. It, it's what we call a ciliopathy which means um, a disorder of a very tiny part of, uh, within the cells. And we now understand bartlett Biss syndrome as a new genetic form of obesity in which some components of the protein would not move 
uh, adequately within the, the cell to their targets so that the expression of uh, uh, some given uh, genes of protein is, uh, is broken or interrupted or uh, um, not efficient enough. So it, it, uh, it Bartley beetle was thought to be a diff very different disease from all other one, and now it's integrated again within the frame of a, this new frame of a broad genetic background of obesity. And we have a new module in development around around sort of genetic components of um, the genetic drivers or the genetic um, genetically related, I should say, um, obesity uh, for for exactly that reason. Because um, and it's it's an important part of the childhood obesity uh, understanding the childhood obesity framework that there are it's not just multifactorial. There are some uh, monofactorial drivers of of childhood obesity mm -hmm. uh, that are many of which are genetic in nature. Um, Interesting question here. Uh, what are your suggestions about creating awareness about obesity as a disease amongst tribal populations? Well, I, I think, uh, as we said previously, that we should not hurt uh, people. So the point is to um, understand what it means for them to be uh, fat, what, uh, which kind of safety uh, they feel there is if a child is, uh, if fat, is fatter uh, than another one, and then to try to uh, uh, to turn their knowledge uh, into another one and to open their mind to another possible significance of fattening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, sort of some of, addressing some of the cultural preferences that may be yes. in place for obesity as a sign of wealth or mm -hmm. or of not uh, experiencing a, a communicable disease or or something else. So, absolutely. Um, I think these have been really excellent questions, and we were we're absolutely happy to answer the rest of them in um, the, uh, as we follow up. Um, one final question, which is quite specific as well. How do you prepare the family to treat neophobia? And I apologize, I'm not familiar well, with that. Well, I think we have to, to distinguish mm -hmm. between um, a neophobia that would uh, be the, um, the indice of uh, some psychological disorder of a child based of a, of, of a broader anxiety and mm -hmm. the fails neophobia, which may be uh, may, may underline a genetic peculiar genetic profile for uh, avoiding bitter tastes, for example, from some sort which is from uh, an educational uh, basis comes from an educational basis. So, if it is um, quite common neophobia, it's normal in young children to go through a period of time where they restrict. The, 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 the range of food they eat. And the importance right. is to insist for parents to ask the children to uh, taste at least once and then represent the food uh, sometimes later. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to wind this down now. I think there's just one more question. I need to know by being a member of WAF, am I allowed, is a person allowed sort of as a member of WAF to conduct an awareness campaign as schools do not allow a single person to come to school? That's a it's a very good question. Um, I think I, I'm not sure that a school would necessarily understand what it what it means to be a member of World Obesity Federation per se. So uh, I think Alexander is going to follow up with with a with a response on that. But in general, if there are ways to build a you know sort of do some outreach to the school and perhaps connect to if there's any health professional on site and and working with them to raise awareness about obesity because we do have uh, lots of great uh, sort of school based uh, approaches and, and that, that can be very useful. And it's an important place to, um, to, uh, to be having an intervention. One final question actually I think is a really interesting one because this is such an important and, and only sort of fairly poorly understood areas. What are your views about or what do you think about endocrine disruptors, which we know have been associated with adult obesity and pediatric obesity? Did you have any thoughts on that or views on that, Marilo? Uh, sorry, I was reading questions. End endocrine disruptors in pediatric obesity, because we know there's an association between endocrine disruptors and obesity among well, adults. It, and... It's very, very difficult to prove something. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have many cues, but we, we can't identify precisely uh, in a human population the role of a given one. In fact, what is important is, is, is try to try to, to decrease the burden of uh, useless chemicals in the environment. Yeah, for many reasons. <laughs> yes. It's one of the reasons there's really a kind of a syndemic approach of addressing 
uh, issues of, of climate change alongside um, underweight and, and overweight and obesity. Thank you very much. I am going to just uh, close out our uh, session today. And I wanna really thank and applaud everyone who joined. I wanna thank you for all the great questions. I wanna thank you for your attention and participation. I hope that you have been as inspired and and uh, I love all the little, uh, we have the little reaction claps and on the, um, on the screen and I share those uh, sentiments very much. Uh, thank you so much, Marie-Laure, and we're very fortunate to have your expertise uh, helping to guide and shape this webinar, and to, you're such a key part of the Clinical Care Committee. kind of a, a crescendo, I guess, on World Obesity Day, but we're aware that there's there's different times. Um, and so please go ahead um, and just come to World Obesity Day, share your plans and, uh, and then share them with us afterwards. So big round of applause to all of you. And uh, thank you so much for an excellent thank you World much. Obesity Day. We're, we're really excited and there's actually a lot to, to be optimistic about. And we do hope and urge that you would be able to join next week's uh, Lancet Summit on Childhood Obesity as well, because I think we'll get a, a, an even broader and, and more in-depth um, world tour of, uh, of childhood obesity, uh, both from the, from the drivers, some of the successful interventions and some of the different cultural challenges depending on geography. So thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day and a very happy World Obesity Day. Thanks. Thank you very much.